Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session on maternal and infant health. Black women in the United States experience unbelievably poor maternal health outcomes, including disproportionately high rates of death related to pregnancy or childbirth. The National Partnership for Women and Families states that Black women are three to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death than white women. Some of these deaths are preventable. The subspecialty of maternal fetal medicine has underserved Black mothers for far too long. We need to address the social, economic, racial, and medical disparities faced by Black women throughout their lifetime so that we can create better health outcomes for Black mothers. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Michelle Ogunole. She is a health disparities researcher, social epidemiologist, and general internal medicine physician, specializing in the care of women with chronic medical conditions. She has advanced training in quality improvement and patient safety science, and is currently practicing in Baltimore, Maryland at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Her research is focused on racial disparities in maternal health outcomes among African American women. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Ogunole. Thank you so much for having me and for that introduction. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. All right, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen and uh, I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here this, this morning and to be able to discuss this issue with you all. Uh, this issue is very near and dear to my heart. So um, I'm excited to go ahead and get, get started. So I have nothing to disclose. So a bit of a roadmap. So today I'm gonna to spend some time reviewing maternal and infant health disparities in the black community. I'll touch a little bit actually on the COVID-19 crisis as it relates to pregnancy health. Um, and then I wanna discuss the reasons behind these disparities in our communities. And finally, I will talk a little bit about where I think we should go from here and how we actually go uh, to a place of healing and health and equity for our community. Um, so I, two important things to kind of think about as I give this talk, uh, this first picture, I think many of us have heard this phrase, healthy mom, healthy baby. And I think it's really critical to the work that I do as a, primarily a maternal health researcher. But what it really means is that it is nearly impossible to disentangle a baby's health or fetal health from maternal health. The two are inextricable inextricably linked as we see in this picture here. And I think the importance of that is that any intervention that we think about that improves maternal health will also improve fetal health. So I'd like you to keep that in mind. And then the other thing that I think is important that'll be kind of a guiding framework for this discussion is something called uh, the three phases of a health equity research agenda. And so I use this personally uh, to think about how I approach my research and how we actually get to solution building. And it's a, a three-step approach that says that in order to get to equity, we have to first start with detecting the problem. So we have to measure it. And then we move to step two, which is understanding it. So why is it actually happening? And then finally, we can move to the place where we can start to reduce these disparities. And so keeping that in mind, I'm gonna start with detection. Um, and this was mentioned a little bit in the introduction, but I wanna go into some detail. So um, the maternal mortality rate, which is the number of women who die uh, related to pregnancy has been rising in the United States. Um, and importantly, the United States um, has the highest mortality, the maternal mortality rate of any developed nation. And these, these, uh, dis these rates have been climbing. Here we see that there are disparities in maternal mortality or pregnancy related mortality. And I'll just point out, this is a data from the CDC that's been taken over several years. And you see in every uh, time period, 
Black women who are represented in the orange bar continue to have the highest maternal mortality rate. Now, even as those rates have decreased slightly over time, we see that the disparities really persist. And as was mentioned in the introduction, these disparities um, amount to a three to four times increased risk of death for black women compared to white women. And that is an average in, in some states in New York, Washington DC, these rates have been up to 12 times higher for black women uh, compared to white women. And I think one of the important things to think about and that has really always been very concerning to me is that um, even when we uh, take into account things like education or economic status or financial security, black women are still more likely to die than white women. In this graphic that I'm showing, this is disparities by education level. We see that black women with at least a college degree still have five times um, high, higher rate of death than a white woman with a high school education. And now to think about why these things are happening. This is a report from nine maternal mortality review committees from several states. Um, and they are showing that the reasons behind the disparities differ but by racial and ethnic groups. So in this picture, um, purple represents uh, black women and we see that in these, in this uh, picture, we see that um, cardiovascular disease is actually the leading cause of death for um, all pregnant people, but that black women are experiencing higher rates of cardiovascular disease related death. Um, so that's important to think about as we try to think about solutions. And I think what's important from this graphic is that when we try to tailor interventions for our own communities, we have to understand and really, uh, really start to dig deeply into why it's happening. So it might be um, more important for us to focus on cardiovascular disease if we were gonna go for the biggest effect. Now, similarly, we see um, almost identical trends when we think about infant health as well. So this is also a map showing infant mortality rate over the last um, several years. This is from actually taken from 2007, but the data and the numbers are very similar. So we see again that uh, black infants have higher uh, mortality rates than other groups. Um, and here again, what I've highlighted is that the top causes of infant death in the population are usually low birth weight. Um, and so I, for every single um, outcome that we see, black babies have a much higher risk than white babies. So in this example, we see that for low birth weight in non-Hispanic white uh, infants who died, that rate was 63. And in black infants, that rate was 241. And so you can go across each of the columns and really see that every single uh, cause of death is higher in black infants. And this actually amounts to black babies having two, almost two and a half times the risk of death um, than white babies. And they're actually almost four times as likely to die from complications related to low birth weight than, um, than white babies. And af black babies also had over two times the risk of sudden infant death um, than white babies. And so again, we see this story of these really persistent um, disparities. And one of the things that I wanted to point out that the, these problems are actually getting better in some states. I think California has done a really great job of reducing maternal mortality, for example. So this graph is showing uh, you know, California versus the rest of the country. So you see California's maternal mortality has really declined substantially um, compared to the rest of the United States where California is in orange in this graph and the US and the United States is kind of climbing up. But one of the things that I wanted to point out is even in California where they've seen really tremendous um, improvements, the, the disparity still exists. So in this graph, we see 
great, the mortality rate has declined, but when we break it down again by race and ethnicity, we see again that black women who are represented on the top bar continue to have higher rates of mortality. And so that gets me to my next point <clears throat> that we really need to understand what's going on. So this is a, um, a pictorial that I usually use to explain racial disparities in maternal health. It's something that I adapted from Dr. Elizabeth Howell, who's um, an obst obstetrician and gynecologist. Um, so, you know, she proposes that there are a lot of things that are going on. Um, if you look at this graph, you see that there, I'm gonna walk you through it. There are patient factors. So those are things like people's social situations, um, their stress level. The, there are also things like community level factors. So that has to do with your neighborhood, your social network. Um, there are things like provider factors, right? So do providers have knowledges, uh, knowledge of the disease um, in front of them? Do they believe their patients? Are they um, discriminating against patients? And then there are systems level factors, right? So what about your access to quality care? And she proposes that all of these things, right, are situated in the context of a patient's race and ethnicity and their underlying health conditions such as chronic medical conditions and that all of these factors are relevant across the pregnancy care continuum which means from preconception to pregnancy to deliver to delivery to postpartum care and that these are the things that ultimately come together and leads to disparities now i think that this model is really helpful because it gives us several areas where we can think about targeting we can come in at the community level and try to think about how we address things um, related to your neighborhood um, we can go to the provider level and think about how we address things related to provider bias but i have one kind of um, addendum that i uh, would like to to share which is that in her model race is seen as the risk factor and I would like to reframe that and challenge that. These are Dr. Joya Career Perry's words, but um, this is from an article that she uh, was, was speaking about this topic in, in 2018. She said, race isn't a risk factor in maternal health, racism is. And so now we're at a point, I think in society where we're more likely to name the problem. It's not black people being black, that's the problem. It's that racism is the problem. And racism operates at different levels. This is um, something from Dr. Kamara Jones, who was the former president of the American Public Health Association and has been talking about this for years and years and years. But I think it's important from her work to conceptualize that racism can occur at several levels. We think about institutional racism, which is the fabric of our society that, um, that this country is really founded on, right? And that racism is really embedded in the systems and the policies and the processes uh, of our country. And it also leads to disparities in health. We think about personally mediated racism as well, which is the idea that we commonly think about is that people can be discriminating against other people. And that could lead to a decreased quality of care that they're giving. And then there's something else called internalized racism, which is um, that the society continues to show uh, negative uh, images of black people and that it can become internalized as well. And all of these things are very dangerous. And when I speak about um, the things that I think are the biggest problem, I always go back to these systems. You know, you think about this country in the United States and we think about the history uh, that I'm talking about that's embedded. So things like redlining, which for those who aren't aware, it has to do with uh, discriminatory practices that kept black people from owning homes and kept them in segregated neighborhoods. And that we can see that that continues to go on today. And in, in areas like Baltimore and across the country, we see that there are uh, neighborhoods that were historically redlined where there are black communities and there are decreased resources that go to those areas. Tobacco and alcohol industries disproportionately target those areas. There's less green space for walking. 
um, there's more environmental pollutions. And I would argue that uh, Black women in particular experience multiple disadvantages at the intersection of not just their race, but also their gender, or, um, which is why I put this picture up here, bell hooks, ain't, and this idea, ain't I a woman? Um, but importantly, I wanted to uh, talk again about that personally mediated racism and what it looks like. So this was a paper that was actually published in 2020 that showed that black newborns were more likely to die when they were looked after by white doctors. And I don't wanna go into the details of the study because of time, but I think it really illuminates this, this problem, right? That racism can happen um, even for babies who just are born into the world and haven't done anything. And so that's how deeply it is embedded into our society. So um, I just wanted to highlight that point. And of course, because we're in a pandemic, I did wanna also just briefly touch on the fact that we know that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been particularly um, terrible for black communities, but we also know that pregnant people have increased risk of illness with COVID-19. And these are just general disparities in COVID-19 where we see black communities um, have at least two times rate of death with COVID-19. And there is mounting data now that we actually see similar problems that are occurring in pregnancy. So the CDC has recently released a report. I'm showing some data just from Illinois that's really showing that black, black women in particular or pregnant people, I should say, um, have a higher risk of a bad outcome if they contract COVID-19 in pregnancy. And there's mounting data that this actually increases the risk of preterm birth as well. And briefly, I just wanted to show this paper was recently published that said that there's this disproportionate burden of actual psychological distress among, uh, among Black pregnant people. And all of this bar graph is just showing uh, the light gray is black, is black people and the black bars are actually white people. And we see that anxiety and depression are increased in our communities as a result of this pandemic, especially for black birthing people. And so these are the kind of uh, issues that are happening related to COVID-19. Um, and I just am showing that the reasons that there are disparities in COVID-19 um, food insecurity, people having to live in close quarters, um, all of these things are the, the same problems that are actually are arising in our communities outside of this pandemic. And so when we jump to this idea of how do we actually reduce these disparities, um, I wanna start with one thing. I think racism is something that we have to continue to say out loud and to continue to target. You know, there's a, this is a infographic from the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine that was, that they worked on with uh, the National Birth Equity Collaborative. And they, they speak about really the, the strategies that we can do to reduce disparities for black women, which will also reduce disparities, I believe, for black infants. And I think one of the in, in, important things that I'd like to highlight and that I highlight in my work is thinking about the role of uh, doulas. So um, there's some evidence that doulas can improve birth outcomes for babies, reduce cesarean delivery rates, um, but there's a lot of problems with accessing them. And so I wrote a piece about how community-based doulas are particularly important for black communities and how they've also um, helped in the COVID-19 pandemic, but that this pandemic has really shown us um, the barriers there are to access doulas and to create sustainable bottles. Uh, I think doulas can help advocate for women and kind of help to break up that, that interpersonal racism that, are, that can be experienced. And that's one, uh, one step forward. Um, but I think more broadly, I don't want us to just think about needing a doula uh, to help disrupt racism. We just need to end racism overall. And that actually is at the um, society level, as well as the policies and the structures that are happening, as well as us targeting the racism that happens between providers and patients. And to that end, I think um, if you address structural and policy level issues that have to do with maternal infant health, then I think that, that those things trickle down and can have an overall impact. 
And so I think that policy ends up being a very powerful level lever to reduce uh, disparities in, in uh, infant and maternal health. And so I'm just showing here something called the Black Maternal Health Momnibus, which really is a, a comprehensive reform plan that has nine bills. And the purpose is really to reduce uh, this Black maternal health crisis. And they do that by making critical investments in social determinants of health, which includes things like housing and transportation and nutrition, thinking about funding community-based organizations such as doulas, um, really thinking about how we increase the diversity of the perinatal workforce, right? So do we have more Black doctors and more Black birth workers? Because we saw from that study with the infants that having a Black provider uh, might be very important to reducing outcomes. And they also are calling for making sure that we have better data quality. I started this talk saying we have to detect these disparities, but we also have to have a way of understanding, um, you know, when we start to put our interventions in place, if we're actually uh, getting towards our aim. Um, and some other things, mandating funding, just to make sure that the review committees are, um, are actually looking at this data, including black women and, and, their, com and their communities and families in the review of uh, infant morbidity and mortality. So when there are complications as well as death, um, expanding Medicaid and other insurance coverage to make sure that women have access to care, addressing pregnancy discrimination by really addressing what's going on within our workforce. I put things like supporting breastfeeding and making high quality childcare uh, affordable and really eliminating harmful work requirements. All of these things can be um, a part of legislation as well. And then finally, I think at the end of the day, my message is always the same, that we, we need to move to a place in our society where we just start to protect black women believe Black women when they say that there's something going on, that there's something wrong, um, believe that they understand what's going on in their bodies and trust them, trust that they also have a sense of what's best for them. And we have to partner with them in healthcare to provide solutions. And I'm just going to end with this. Um, this is something that I use in my own practice. And it's a quote from Dr. Rhea Boyd, it says, love is the bar. So in all this talk of equity, we also forget the point. Black people absolutely deserve equity, but more than that, we deserve love. That is the bar. Anything less belies the value and dignity of Black lives. And I think that if we move to a place where we say this isn't just about reducing disparities, but how do we show love to our communities and respect and protect Black women with that spirit of love, then we can actually get to um, a point where this is no longer a crisis and that we can live abundant lives. So I'm gonna stop there. I think I have five minutes left for questions. And so I have several questions in the, so I have some um, questions I'm just gonna go through. Um, so somebody asked me, do I have any data to show how poor outcomes in expecting mothers with sickle cell disease contributes to the black maternal health crisis overall? I think that's such an important question. Um, I didn't put that data into this presentation, but um, there is certainly uh, research that shows that women with sickle cell anemia have higher complications uh, than women who you obviously don't. Uh, so black women with sickle cell anemia tend to have higher rates of uh, miscarriage, um, preterm birth, and pregnancy complications compared to their counterparts. And they are at risk of having cardiovascular disease uh, related complications because of their sickle cell disease as well. I've taken care of a number of these patients. A, a sickle cell, uh, we have a sickle cell center at uh, Johns Hopkins. So I've taken care of a number of these patients. I think that there needs to be more work in this area in particular. I know so, somebody else had a question. I know someone that has just had their first baby. I'm concerned about her. How do I talk to her about postpartum depression? So thank you for raising that. You know, again, I didn't get to touch on all of these really important things. I think postpartum depression is um, such a, a big issue that um, when you look at the data, it looks like it's not as big of a problem in our communities as it is in white communities. But I think that oftentimes, we don't talk about these issues of postpartum depression. And 
And so I think part of it is just normalizing that it happens often, you know, um, and that there is help. So I think that saying that there's a lot of people who experience baby blues or depressive symptoms after their baby, their hormones are, you know, fluctuating. And it's really common. And I think that there are, um, there are hotlines and people that you can talk to about this. And there is also sometimes medications available. And none of that means that there's anything wrong with the mom. But I think part of it is just normalizing that it happens really often and encouraging people to get help. And it's not just about um, going to church or praying for people. I think we can do both. We can pray for our friends and pray for our family and pray for ourselves that we'll get better and continue to seek professional help because these are really tough um, problems that we're talking about. Um, so another question I have, why isn't Black maternal health information easily accessible in the Black community? I think this question is from Darren Martin. And um, this is a great question. Um, I don't really know that I know the full answer to that. One of the things that I've realized in my own research is that are, there are so many resources available to Black communities, but it's not transparent. It's not easy. Um, to find. And sometimes there are multiple organizations that are providing great services. And yet, uh, when you ask Black women, they don't know about them at all. Um, or they're not, they're confused about who to call, or the processes to access this information or these services is not clear, or it's not easy. And so people kind of give up. Um, and so I, I think there are a lot of issues with that. I don't know why it's not easily accessible, but I will say something, Darren. I think going back to this idea of community health workers, community doulas, people who are in the community, I think that they are the, one of the most powerful ways that we can think about getting um, not only just information, right? We wanna have accurate information and to decrease misinformation because people hear things on social media in the streets, et cetera and um, they don't always know if it's true. So I think having black doulas, black health workers, black community health workers in our communities um, may be one way to make sure that that information is accessible. I also know as a doctor, I try to be more active on social media because I think that that's where people are hanging out, so to speak. And so making sure people know the credentials of the people who are talking to them on social media but also trying to put that um, information out there as well. I think it's something that we have to continue to work on. Um, there's another question. What can black pregnant women do to ensure they're getting the best care? I think that this is a complicated um, answer and I'll end with this because I know I think we're short on time, but um, you know, I think that number one, I don't think that the, the responsibility to improve this is on black people completely. They are, we are in a system of oppression. And so part of that is that there needs to be some type of reparation for some of the things that are occurring that are leading to our bad outcomes, right? The fact that we have, don't have access to the best um, education systems or the neighborhoods, et cetera. Those are things that are not on us to change. But um, the other piece of it is I think that we can advocate for, we can try to advocate for ourselves. So I think that um, if you feel comfortable make sure that you have a doctor or a provider that you feel comfortable asking questions to and that you feel respected and valued. And if you don't, and if I know this, everyone can't do this, but if you can change providers, if you feel that you're uncomfortable, change. I tell people, if you have a gut feeling, change it. Um, I think having doulas, if you are able to access them is a great strategy just to have someone on your team. A doula is a helper of women. That's their role. And I think Sometimes it's good just to have someone who's in your corner that's focused on you. Um, and then I think just this idea that when you go to a provider, you have a right to have every single question answered and you shouldn't leave until you understand everything. So um, I think going in with that mentality that these providers work for me is something that I try to encourage my patients um, to, to think through. And there's so many other questions that I, um, I can't get to because our session's over, but I, I'm hoping I'd love to collect some of them and I'll see if the, you know, if the people who are hosting this 
um, are hosting this would let me, but uh, follow me on my social media. I'm on at Dr. Shell MD, D R C H E L L E M D. Um, I have a website and I'm on Instagram and Twitter. So feel free to reach out to me and message me that way as well. So thank you all for your time.